You are now tuned into the Bush Leagues of Talk Radio, right here on the all new K98 Talk. Listening to the Morning Mashup, a production of Common Ground Media Group, Oklahoma, only on K98Talk.com. Yeah, I forgot about that talking part at the end of that uh, little intro. Hey guys, my name's Dave. You're listening to the Morning Mashup here on K98Talk. This is the first show. I'm hoping I'm going to make it work. We'll see what happens. It's part of the all-new uh, K98Talk.com morning lineup. Uh, this show is a bit of a cluster you-know-what. Talk about all sorts of different stuff, ranging from everything from politics to religion, uh, to comic books, movies, and even a little bit of pro wrestling, which we're going to start the show off with today. Last night was the uh, Tables, Ladders, Chairs pay-per-view with the WWE, and they were going to unify the two uh, titles. Uh, For those of you who uh, may not follow professional wrestling, the WWE, former WWF, for about... Going on 10 years now, has actually had two major titles. It all started back when they purchased WCW uh, back in 2001, and they integrated the WCW titles into the WWE, which was a great idea, um, because the WCW was an organization that was owned by uh, Warner Brothers, uh, which had been owned before that by Ted Turner, uh, which had before that been Jim Crockett Promotions, And Jim Crockett Promotions was part of the NWA back in the day and has a legacy with the NWA going back almost 100 years, actually over 100 years at this point. So the WCW eventually, once once Ted Turner fully bought WCW from Jim uh, Crockett, the uh, the company eventually parted ways with the NWA, but was able to keep the title heritage. So when, w- or when WWE purchased WCW, they kept the WCW World Heavyweight title and the United States Heavyweight title. And um, at one point in 2002, the titles were uh, merged, reunified. And then after um, a while, they were broken back up. Um, I have been against the idea of having a unified champion for a while, Um, if nothing else, because it really... um, It's like the final nail in the coffin of WCW. I first got into professional wrestling through the likes of Hulk Hogan. And... uh, so admittedly, I'm I know the WWE, but when when I got into wrestling and I really started following it on TBS on Saturday mornings, there was a great show called World Championship Wrestling, which was a Jim Crockett Promotions show, and had the NWA stars, and it was the home of the Four Horsemen, Ric Flair, uh, eventually Sting, Barry Windham, Lex Luger. Um, a fabulous Freebird showed up there, and I also watched uh, World Class Championship Wrestling out of Texas. And for me, those shows, especially uh, the WCW stuff, was so much better than what was going on in the WWE. And I always was just kind of more attracted to those, to that uh, brand. And during the 90s, during the whole big... Uh, Monday Night Wars, I was a much bigger fan of WCW, even though at times its product sucked. But then again, so did the WWEs. And uh, so, yeah, so seeing WWE finally merge these two titles, 
to me kind of sucks because you're you're now saying goodbye to the legacy of WCW, which maybe they want to do. Maybe their McMahon's really ready to just put that to bed as he did beat his competition. And so, okay, fine. But the the problem I see with only having one major title is at this point, despite the fact that there is TNA, uh, despite the fact that there is Ring of Honor and there's some pretty major, there's at least one major wrestling organization out of uh, England, uh, the WWE is it. There is one place to go. It's the major leagues. And thus there's no real competition. I mean, the WWE's major competition to some extent is TNA, but is more uh, UFC and other sporting events. And um, because of that, the organization is very, very big, very large. And I think it, it squashes opportunity only having one title, one major belt is, uh, is a bummer. But so on to the match itself, uh, which I did not watch. I'm poor. I don't watch pay-per-views, but according to this, uh, handy dandy recap here, I found over at, uh, wrestlingnewsworld.com, uh, Randy Orton, ended up winning you know now one thing I, I i would like to i think is cool the the second the runner-up match was daniel bryan versus the wyatt family daniel bryan's awesome um he is just really really great uh he unfortunately lost uh, and the show opened up with uh cm punk against um the shield uh cm punk law uh, won um but interestingly, the United States title was not defended. In fact, this is the at least second pay-per-view in a row where the U.S. title has not been defended. So I have a bad feeling that they're going to eventually merge the U.S. title and the Intercontinental title. And uh, one of the things that always, another reason why I liked WCW more back in the day is they had more titles. They had a world title, they had the United States title, which was their second highest belt, kind of... Um, it, it was like the WWE's Intercontinental title. And then they had a world television title, which was kind of the third title there. And so there were there were more belts or more opportunities for, for, the, for the wrestlers. And I thought that was great. So getting rid of, um, if they get rid of the U.S. title and they've gotten rid of the, the, they've merged the world and the WWE titles, which are basically the, the titles of Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair is the way you can look at it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Then it leaves a gigantic locker room with very few belts. And that's just not cool. Excuse me. So, um, anyway, so back to the match. Um, from what I can tell, it looks like it was probably a pretty decent match. Um, one of Randy Wharton's problems since he won the title he has almost all his pay-per-view title defenses. He's had to have interference to win. He needed interference to beat Daniel Bryan. He needed interference to beat the big show. Uh, in this match, it looks like he did not have any interference. So here we got two of the WWE's biggest modern stars. John Cena, they, their absolute biggest star right now. Um, and Randy Orton. Uh, John Cena has won an obnoxious amount of titles. Apparently, he's going after Ric Flair's record, which is fine. He can do that. Go for him. But admittedly, seeing these two guys again going for the belts is a little boring. Because when haven't these guys won titles? But and Randy Orton's kind of a jerk, and he's got these weird are ta- his arm tats. They look weird. I mean it. He, he needs to bring that over onto his pecs and look, fill that up because it looks all, it's like he's got sleeves on for no reason. Anyway, uh, during the match, it basically boiled down to uh, Randy Orton got out some, um, oh, was, by the way, this was a table, ladders, chairs match, which the belts were hanging above the ring and whoever grabbed them wins. 
uh, and basically no DQ stuff all over the place. But uh, Orton got some handcuffs, handcuffed uh, John Cena to the to the bottom rope. Uh, Cena eventually unhooked the turnbuckle so he could start climbing the um, the ladder to get to the to the belts. Orton yanked the the rope, pulling him pulling Cena off of the uh, ladder. Cena goes headfirst into a table, which subsequently apparently did not break. And Orton goes up the ladder, gets the belts, and wins. Uh, and then apparently Vince McMahon finally makes a a return to the ring, shows up, shakes Randy Orton's hand, um, hugs so does Triple H and Stephanie, and show is over. Um, Randy Orton's kind of a smug piece of crap, but um, we'll see what happens. And now this is all, you know, going to kind of run into what's going to happen with WrestleMania. And um, in WrestleMania, you've got well, whoever the winner of the Royal Rumble is will go for the title. And there's been all sorts of talk about well. It's probably going to be The Undertaker's last WrestleMania. So there's talk about bringing in Sting for a dream match, which would be fantastic. Except I'd hate to see Sting's last... I mean, his only match in the WWE be in WrestleMania against The Undertaker because you know he's going to job. You wrestle The Undertaker at WrestleMania, you lose. Just as the way it goes. Um... And then there's talk about, you know, maybe Hogan and John Cena having a match. Well, Hulk Hogan is is just in no physical shape to do a match. He's apparently got this pain regulator thing in his back. And if he just, if he does any falls, it's going to break apart and he's going to be in all sorts of bad hell of pain. And, and uh, that wouldn't be cool. I mean, you know, Hogan's done his thing and... He doesn't really need to, you know, get jacked up anymore. Um, even though what I would like to see is if they are going to use Hogan and have it again, Hogan Cena situation, I would like to see Cena turn heel and uh, basically betray Hogan. I think that would be an interesting angle. Um, I think a lot of time, I think a lot of fans are getting kind of sick of John Cena because he has been the the big face of everything, and uh, people get kind of uh, I think they get a little tired of it. So we'll see what happens. And um, going into Royal Rumble and everything, that uh, it'll be interesting to see what goes on. But um, yeah, that's kind of the whole wrestling thing that I was going to talk about, and. Oh, this is going to be a long two hours. That only took up 15 minutes. Great. So, yeah, morning mashup here. We're going to try to uh, start a fledgling network. And um, originally this was going this time slot was going to be held by um, my good friend Robert, who hosts the um, Off the Rails show. Uh, he and I started this all out with a show uh, called Finding Common Ground where we talked about politics and and trying to focus on the issues that bring people together instead of um, pulling people apart and um, you know I think it I think it worked um, it was fun it's a lot of fun to do but uh, Roberts had some career changes and so he's unable to do the morning shows and with what I do, which I happen to work for the Norman Public Library, my work schedule is a little bit all over the place. And um, because of that, um, we will probably end up having to do our show just on the weekends. Uh, in the meantime, we have a daily you know, time slot that needs to be filled. And uh, I got the awesome privilege of doing that. Um, so, yeah, that's what... Uh, what we are doing. So, um, okay, here's something random and I'm going to, I've got some stories I've been holding on to for a while 
uh, things I want to talk about. And some things came up in the news this last week that I think would be interesting to discuss. Um, yeah, but uh, you are listening to K98talk.com. I appreciate everyone joining in. But uh, so here over on the website, DyingScene.com, which is a, uh, a punk news website. It's pretty similar to punknews.org, but uh, with a slight difference in in coverage. It's hard to explain, but uh, people who read it can kind of, you know, tell the difference. But um, they put together a list of six must-see movies for any self-respecting punk fan. So uh, this is pretty interesting. Number one on the list is Suburbia. Uh, Suburbia was a film came out in the 1980s, actually came out in 84. It was about a bunch of street kids who happened to be uh, punks and skinheads. Uh, Flea from the Red Hot Chili Peppers is in it. Uh, the Vandals um, perform in the movie. It is, uh, it's actually a, a pretty cool, pretty cool movie. Um, number two, Return of the Living Dead. And this is the punk rock for um, zombie film. I have to admit, I've never actually seen that one. Three on the list is SLC Punk, which um, stands for uh, Salt Lake City. And, you know, I saw this movie. I wasn't that impressed with it. There's a lot going on there that is pretty stereotypical about punk rock. And, um, and I just, I know a lot of people loved it. I, I just didn't. I mean, it had a pretty good soundtrack. It had stuff from the Stooges and the Ramones and the Specials. Uh, the Exploited, who I hate with a fiery passion. Um, Dead Kennedys, Vandals, Adolescence, Generation X, Blondie. And um, so, I mean, the, the music in it was good. They also had... Um, oh, God, what was that band? Um... They had a, a ska punk band in in the movie that um, Suicide Machines uh, played as like a house band for a show, um, but obviously they weren't around in the eighties. Uh, number four on the list, Repo Man. That one was another one that's a great soundtrack film from the eighties, starring Emilio Estevez. Sadly, I actually never saw that either. Uh, Sid and Nancy, which is the story of Sid Vicious and Nancy Spudnick. Um, that is a very good movie, very creepy movie. Um, and it really puts the Sex Pistols in a different light because, uh, the Sex Pistols album, Nevermind the Bullocks, is amazing. I mean, it is a pretty flawless record from top to bottom. Those guys were a holes, though. I mean, really. Uh, Sid Vicious was a complete drugged out loon. And Johnny Rotten's just a jerk. Uh, so that kind of put a damper on my enjoyment of the tunage. And um, let's see what uh, next on the list, number six, Rock and Roll High School. That is actually a fun movie. It's a Ramones movie, and it is just a lot of fun. I enjoyed that a lot. Oh, yeah. Hey, that was the last one on the list. So, uh, yeah, good times. Also, as the year's coming to an end, we're going to, I'm going to bring up, um, lists of, uh, albums of the year and, uh, do the different sites have, have, uh, have put out and kind of go over those. And then I'll even go over my own cause I write a blog, which you can find over at Oklahoma It is a primarily music blog. I used to write a lot about politics before I kind of lost my, um, my stomach for politics, which is ironic, of course, being the fact that I've been co-hosting a, uh, political talk show, but that's what this one is, is not just politics. Um, so let's see here. And yeah, I've been, we've been doing this, uh, the show for a while, but we're with me and me in this new format doing this by myself. Um, probably have moments of silence. It's probably going to be a white hot mess. And, uh, so 
we'll see what happens. Yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, okay. Anywho. Um, so, oh man, I didn't know if I wanted to get into the story yet, but I'll just go ahead and do this. Um, okay. Let me find... Oh, where is it? 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 <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, found this story over on MSN News. Uh, so, uh, headline, Satanist Seek Spot on Oklahoma State House Steps. <sighs> Republican lawmakers in Oklahoma may have unwittingly opened the door to a satanic statue when they approved a Ten Commandments monument for the State House Steps, Oklahoma City. And uh, let's make a note of the tremendous journalism done here in the story. Yeah, I'm totally being sarcastic because yeah, just you'll see. In their zeal to tout their faith in public square, conservatives in Oklahoma may have unwittingly opened the door to a wide range of religious groups, including Satanists, who are seeking to put up their own statue next to a Ten Commandments monument on the State House steps. The Republican controlled legislator in the state in in the state known as the Buckle Belt of the Bible Belt authorized the privately funded Ten Command Ten Commandments Monument in two thousand nine, and it was placed on the Capitol grounds last year, despite criticism from legal experts who questioned its constitutionality. The Oklahoma chapter of the American Civil Liberties Union has filed a lawsuit seeking its removal. But the New York-based Satanic Temple saw an opportunity. It notified the state's Capital Preservation Commission that it wants to donate a monument and plans to submit uh, one of several possible designs this month, said Lucian Gre uh, Greaves, a spokesman for the temple. Quote, We believe that all monuments should be in good taste and consistent with community standards, and uh, Greaves wrote in a letter to state officials, our proposed monument as an homage to the historic slash literal Satan will certainly abide by these guidelines, end quote. Graves or Greaves uh, said one potential design involves a pentagram, a satanic symbol, while another is meant to be an interactive display for children. Yes, kids, you too can learn about the devil. Uh, he said he expects the monument, if approved by Oklahoma officials, which it won't be, uh, would cost about $20,000. Hey, I've got an idea. If you guys just really want to throw away $20,000, um, there's this fantastic charity you can donate to. It's called the Dave Brown Fund. Uh, I do take checks, so if you want to, contact me through the station, and we'll get that set up. Uh, a couple wonderful kids I can go to, and uh, so great stuff. Yeah, never mind. I was going to explain that joke, but if you don't get it, then I just don't care. Um, Rep. Mike Ritz, a Republican of Broken Arrow, who spearheaded the push for the Ten Commandments monument and whose family helped pay the pay the ten thousand dollars for its construction declined to comment on the satanic temple's effort but greaves credited ritz for opening the door to the group's proposal quote he's helping a satanic agenda grow more than any of us possibly could greaves said you don't walk around and see too many satanic te it's temples around but when you open the door to public spaces for us that's when you're going to see us end quote the oklahoma legislature has taken other steps uh, that many believe blur the line that divides church and state the house speaker said he wants to build a chapel inside the capitol to celebrate oklahoma's quote judeo-christian heritage end quote Several lawmakers have said they want to allow nativity scenes and other religious themed symbols in public schools. <clears throat> uh, 
uh, Rep. Bobby Cleveland, who plans to introduce one such bill next year, said many Christians feel they are under attack as a result of political correctness. He dismisses the notion of Satanists erecting a monument at the Capitol. Well, he shouldn't because it's, uh, if they fight it to the Supreme Court, <laughs> they're probably going to win, guys. Uh, quote, I think these Satanists are a different group. Cleveland, a Republican of Slaughterville, said, you put them under the nut category, end quote. Brad, uh, Brady Henderson, legal director for the ACLU Oklahoma, said if the state officials allow one type of religious expression, they must allow alternative forms of expression, although he said a better solution might be to allow none at all on state property. Quote, we would prefer to see Oklahoma's government officials work to faithfully serve our communities and improve the lives of Oklahomans instead of erecting granite monuments to show us how righteous they are. Amen, sir, Henderson said. But if the Ten Commandments, with its overtly Christian message, is allowed to stay at the Capitol, the Satanic, te the satanic Temple's proposed monument cannot be rejected, rejected because it's different, uh, it's of because of its different religious viewpoint. Yeah, I couldn't agree with them more there. That, uh, But it gets worse. Um, one sec here. Let me find that. Sorry about the silence. I was uh, doing multiple things at once here. Okay. So again, this one's coming from uh, this one's coming from MSNBC, the Rachel Maddow show, uh, which I do not watch because I don't have cable. Uh, but I saw this linked on Facebook. And this is uh, her the this week in God. Uh, this is by Steve Bennon. Uh, first up from the God Machine this week is a story out of Oklahoma where state Republican officials were so eager to promote uh, government-endorsed religious displays, they inadvertently opened the door uh, to religious monuments they really won't like. Um, and this is a quote of an article from the Washington Post. New York-based satanic group plans to submit designs this month for a monument to erect... Uh, on this, blah, blah, blah. Okay, that just kind of reiterates what I was talking about. Okay, go on. Oops. In this case, the $20,000 satan satanic monument on the grounds of the Oklahoma State Capitol would, like the uh, Ten Commandments display, be privately financed. Tax pa taxpayers wouldn't pay a dime. All the satan satanic temple would need is com uh, comparable public space provided by the state legislature for the, uh, for the Christian monument in 2009. ACL, uh, ACLU Oklahoma has already reminded state officials that they cannot discriminate on the base of religious viewpoints. And that actually links over to a story on Politico, um, which is more about the same thing. Um, let's see here. Which brings us back to the underlying principle we discussed in July in an open forum, the government can't play favorites. Uh, if the government is going to devote space to promoting one religious monument celebrating the tenets of one faith, it cannot deny space to other religions that expect equal treatment. It's easy to imagine the Oklahoma State Capitol reserving space for everyone. Um, Baptists, Buddhists, and the Baha'is, as well as Sikh, Scientologists, and Satanists. There are, after all, no second-class American citizens when it comes to the First Amendment. If one group has the right to erect a monument, so does everyone else. And uh, the, I'm going to pause here for just a second. On, see, this is this is that's big. Because if you truly believe in liberty then you need to believe in liberty for all. If you believe in religious freedom, that means religious freedom for everybody. So if, if you want to put up a privately funded monument to uh, the Ten Commandments 
on the the capital of uh, of the state, the Capitol building, you have to allow other organizations, other religious organizations, to do the same thing. Now, if no one shows up, fine. But you have to allow that opportunity. So when the Satanists come knocking, and as as long as it's within the the guidelines, you can't say no. The problem, though, is this is where so many, especially so many Christian conservatives, fall into the "I want freedom, but for people who think like me," and that is so prevalent in Oklahoma. Uh, they people will will talk and scream about religious freedom and all that. Um, Okay, yeah, Steve, that my my good friend Steve's listening apparently. Yes, it is it's part of Judeo-Christian religious faith, but you know. Um but if you're going to if you're going to do one, if you really if you really truly believe in liberty and freedom, you can't just say, "Well, my my religion can have this, but yours can't." Uh which brings us to a, an absolute kook that they mention in the rest of the story. Um so let's continue. It seems likely that the that officials in Oklahoma will be less than enthusiastic about welcoming a permanent satanic display to sit near the Ten Commandments display, but they probably should have thought this through before. No chiz. Uh, they open the door, and it's going to get crowded uh, as others walk through. And I hope more walk through. I really do. I hope there's. I hope there's a. Uh, I hope what would be really awesome is if a Muslim organization came in and wanted to put up a, a Muslim monument because that would stick in the craw so bad of so many people here and it would be great and they shouldn't get mad about it. You know, <laughs> speaking of, um, before we get on to the absolute nut bar, uh, that is actually covered next in the story. I was at work yesterday and, um, we are in the process of, of moving everything around in the library because we're getting our carpet replaced. But this gentleman, older gentleman came in and um, he was having some issues with his laptop and uh, we'd been helping him. And he made some comment about, well, somehow his birthday came up and apparently his birthday is on September 11th. And he had made a comment about how people, you know, the first few years after the 9-11 attacks, they would say things to him on his birthday regarding the attacks, but then said not anymore. He's like, well, I guess people just forget about those 3000 lives lost in an instant. And then he started going on on this tirade about letting Muslims into this country because Muslims want to destroy us. And, and he just kept talking like this. And it was, it was not only mind boggling, it was really disheartening. And he, I've talked to this guy before. He's actually a nice dude. Just an older guy, and um, you know, I stopped at one point. I said, "You know, you really can't blame all Muslims. You can't assume that all Muslims are out to attack us because of the actions of a few. That's just like assuming that all Christians are the same as Timothy McVeigh, uh, the Unabomber." And the people that bomb abortion clinics. Um, and he was like, well, you're always going to have homegrown terrorists of some kind. But he was just talking about letting people bring, letting Muslims come into the country. And thankfully we got interrupted. We got interrupted and then I had to go help somebody because it just, he might've gotten upset. He eventually left soon after that. Um, but it just was unbelievable. I mean, think about it. If you're a Christian, think of the absolute craziest, kookiest Christians out there. I mean, most people automatically think of the Westboro Baptist Church because those people are, are nuck and futz. But do you really want all non-Christians to make the assumption or to draw the uh, 
vastly inaccurate conclusion that because you're a Christian, you must be just like the Westboro guys, that you must be just like Timothy McVeigh, that you must be just like the people that, that bomb abortion clinics. I mean, is that because that's exactly what you're doing when you go and you assume that, that you know, uh, make grand assumptions about Muslims and terrorism and about Muslims wanting to take over the world. Uh, because it is, it, not only is it inaccurate and unfair, it's just, it's unequitable and it's, unre- it's unreasonable. We've all heard the saying about, you know, uh, about how a bad apple can ruin a bunch, but why would you judge an entire group based on the actions of a few people? I mean, in America, aren't we, aren't we supposed to be, you know, pro the individual? And if so, why would you want to take an individual at his or her own merit and, and, you know, for lack of a better term, judge them by that and not simply by their religion? Which brings us back to one of my favorite organizations in the world. Um, if you can't tell I'm dripping with sarcasm here. <laughs> um, okay, and this is again from the, uh, the God Machine. The American Family Associations, God, I hate that organization. Brian Fisher argued this week that the First Amendment protects free exercise of Christianity, but not other religions. Okay, let me, uh, let's, let me reiterate this. This guy believes that when the founders wrote the Constitution, that they were only talking about Christianity, that the word religion means Christian. So let that sink in for a minute. Now, who was one of the main architects of the U.S. Constitution? James Madison. Who was James Madison's, um, for lack of a better term, idol? Who was his his mentor? Thomas Jefferson. What are one of the three things that Thomas Jefferson was most proud of? Was it the Louisiana? It wasn't the Louisiana Purchase. Wasn't even his presidency. It was the religious freedom bill that he wrote in Virginia that was finally passed when uh, Madison was governor. Also, guys like Madison and Jefferson worked to keep references to specific Christian references out of the Constitution, out of the Declaration of Independence. These guys were chastised for not specifically laying out things like God and Jesus in our founding documents. So why would they leave why would they not put that in there? If they were and these guys were were good with their words. They were particular with their words. If they were really talking just about Christianity, why wouldn't they say that? Now obviously we can't ask them because we're not there. I mean, if we had a time machine, that would be kind of cool. Go back in time, see all that. I bet it smelled really bad though. I bet it smelled really bad. Because of all the, you know, screwed up things that the world is, and the world's pretty jacked up right now. Bathing is a good thing. It's a glorious thing. And <laughs> I just can only imagine the O'Dares that we would run into back in the day. But, seriously, why? If they meant 
only Christianity would they use the word religion. And uh, so, from... Now, take this with a grain of salt, because uh, uh, the This Week in God links to a story from a website called Right Wing Watch. Okay, so, right off the bat, you know with a name like that, you know this these fools have an agenda. This isn't about promoting the truth, it's about promoting their agenda, which is fine. More power to them, whatever. So, remember that, take that with a grain of salt. So, let me read this story to you. Um, On his radio broadcast yesterday, uh, Brian Fisher spent two segments laying out his argument that when the founders of this nation used the word religion, what they really meant was Christianity. As such, authorities in Oklahoma have every right to reject an effort by Satanists to erect a monument outside the Oklahoma Capitol building uh, next to a monument of the Ten Commandments. Fisher said, Because the Constitution guarantees the free exercise of religion was... Wait a minute, hold on, let me try that. Fisher said, Because the Constitution's guarantee of the free exercise of religion was never intended to protect anything other than Christianity. Oh my God. Does anyone else's just hairs on the back of their neck stand up with just not only rage, but disgust hearing that? Ugh. Okay, so we're going to go on, and this is quoting Fisher. If by religion, Fisher said, the founders and the founders of the state of Oklahoma meant Christianity, then you can ban a monument to Satan because that's not Christianity. You can say, no, we're not going to let you do it. Our Constitution protects the free exercise of the Christian religion. Yours is not a Christian expression. We're not going to have that monument. If we don't understand the word religion to mean Christianity as the founders intended it, then we have no way to stop Islam. We have no way to stop Satanism. We have no way to stop any other sort of sinister religion practice that might creep onto the fruited plains. I'm going to read that again, because that's some scary, scary shit right there. It really is. Uh, If by religion, the founders and the founders of the state of Oklahoma meant Christianity, then you can ban a monument to Satan because that's not Christianity. You can say, no, we're not going to let you do it. Our Constitution protects the free exercise of the Christian religion, not yours. It's not a Christian expression We're not going to have that monument. If we don't understand the word religion to mean Christianity as the founders intended it, then we have no way to stop Islam. We have no way to stop Satanism. We have no way to stop any other sort of sinister religion practice that might creep onto the fruited plains. Okay, I don't know Brian Fisher from Adam. I'm not going to assume to know what's in this guy's heart, what his intentions are. And I listened to his uh, these segments. I wasn't able to listen to all of them yesterday, but I listened to a good chunk of them. Because I wanted to, I didn't want to take right wing watch at their word. Because God knows that a website like this is going to, you know, um, paint things in a way to make sure that the people they disagree with look terrible and the people that they agree with look great. Truth be damned. Um, so I listened to this guy's stuff, and I would have, I wanted to try to get some some sound clips from it, but I'm just not that good with the like computers and stuff. So I know there's a way to do that through his program called Audacity. And I haven't figured it out yet. I'm just not that smart. Anywho. Um, the, 
this comes across as so bigoted and so arrogant. And this man sounds like such a xenophobe. It's not even funny. So what, and even if you're someone that believes that anyone who doesn't follow the Christian faith is going to hell, fine. You're, you know what, you are, you have the freedom to believe that. I personally think you're wrong, but I'm also humble enough to know that I'm very well could be and probably am wrong. And if that is the case, I know that the, uh, that, the devil is uh, shining up a seat for me on the southbound train. He's getting that that puppy all nice and ready for me, and I'm gonna have a, a nice long uh, dip in a molteny fire bath, and it will be a uh, it'll be good times. Because I'm sorry, as long as I have lived, even from being a little kid, I cannot fathom the idea of a god that would damn someone to hellfire for simply not believing in some religious doctrine. It makes no logical sense. It makes no spiritual sense. It is the equivalent of, of a child having a, a temper tantrum because he or she's not getting their way. So, is God really that much of an insecure ass? I don't think so. I really don't. I, I wholeheartedly believe that there is something out there. Call it God. Call it the Tao. Call it Brahma. Call it whatever the hell you want to call it. There's something out there beyond our comprehension that started all of this. And humanity has interpreted that divine spirit, that divine energy, in countless different ways over the millennia. That's the reason why we have so many different religions, why we've had so many different myths, and that's why so many, um, so many of stories have similar archetypes and and themes that show up time and time again over over countless millennia from cultures that are so dramatically different. It's the only thing that makes sense to me. But you look at a guy like Fisher, who, who apparently believes that it's his way or the highway. So much so that he is taking his, his beliefs to the point of rewriting history. And now to be fair, uh, folks from every walk of life, uh, from every political leaning, have taken things that have happened in history, especially great people from history, and tried to use them and say, oh, oh hey, he, he's one of us. She's one of us. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. I mean, look at the way people clamor over the legacy of JFK or or Martin Luther King. Uh, it's just a couple of great examples. But... Crap, where's I going? Lost my train of thought. Um, oh, so to some extent, there is always going to be, and, and I think some of it is unintentional that, you know, we just do in our own heads looking at history and wanting it to correspond with or to, um, what's the word, reaffirm your own beliefs. But I think from everything I have read about the history of the founders, especially guys like Monroe, or I'm sorry, Madison and Jefferson trying to say that when they used the word religion, they were referring only to Christians 
is ridiculous. For Pete's sake, Thomas Jefferson wasn't even a Christian. He was a he was a a deist. And he was a deist who had though he had a, a very very devout belief in God, he highly doubted the Bible. The man edited the thing for Pete's sake. He went and took out all the supernatural stuff out of the Bible, out of the, uh, the New Testament, and left us with stories about Jesus that teach great lessons without Jesus being the Son of God or anything mystical. So to sit back and say, well, it, was, it only meant Christians. We're only Obviously, he's only talking about Christianity. No, this is the same idiotic uh, ideology that sits back and looks at the Declaration of Independence and the fact that they use words like providence and creator and think, oh, well, obviously, he, he's a Christian. He's promoting Christianity. No. Do you people not realize that the conservative Christians of the day hated Thomas Jefferson with a fiery, fiery passion? When he ran for president, there were groups saying that God would come out of the heavens and smite the United States for putting such a heretic in the presidency. And it didn't happen. And he's looked at as one of our, you know, great founders. Um, so this is this is what happens when people sit back and they look at the founding, and they think, you know, it, we're 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 Judeo Christian nation. We are a, we are a nation based on Christianity. Hogwash. Uh, did Christianity and Judeo-Christian values have an influence on this country? Absolutely. Uh, you cannot look at the history, look at people uh, like John Adams and and not see how religion played a factor in it. But just as much, just as importantly, these were students of the Enlightenment. Thomas Jefferson, I think, took a whole lot more from John Locke than he did from Jesus Christ. I think that's a pretty safe um, conclusion to make. So when you get guys like Fisher saying, no, it's they're just talking about Christianity, not only is he wrong, I mean comically wrong, um, it also just shows how bigoted that point of view can can at least appear, if not be. Christians a lot of times complain about the way that they get labeled, uh, and rightfully so. There are some people that talk some serious trash on Christians, undeservedly so. But then you got guys like this. Make those stereotypes come true. And uh, it's just really, really sad. And uh, let's see here. My good friend Steve is chiming in here on... Uh, it hit me up on the chats. Oh, by the way, if you guys want to shoot me an email, feel free. My email address is oklahomalefty at gmail.com. That's oklahomalefty, L-E-F-T-Y, at gmail.com. Love to hear from you. Uh, you can tell me I'm crazy. You can tell me I suck. I, these are a couple of things I already know about myself. Because, let's be honest, folks. We all suck. At the right time. You know what I'm talking about. And if you don't, I'm sorry. But anyway. Um, let's see here. Here's what Steve says. I think that if they meant... It to mean Christianity only, they would have used the word Christianity rather than religion. I concur. Um, okay, and this is something that airs a quote about Jefferson. Though he often expressed his opposition to clergy and to Christian doctrines, Jefferson repeatedly expressed his belief 
in a deistic God and his admiration for uh, Jesus as a moral teacher. During the 1800 presidential campaign, the New England Palladium wrote, Should the infidel Jefferson be elected to the presidency, the seal of death is uh, that moment set on our holy religion, our churches... Our, our, our churches will be prostrated, and some infamous uh, and some infamous prostitute, under the title of goddess of reason, will preside in the sanctuaries now devoted to the worship of the Most High. Wow! Hey, Steve, where'd you get that? I'm gonna. He's gonna tell me where he found that. That's a that's a perfect example of <clears throat> how the Christians of the day loathed hated this man. They truly did. They could not stand him. They couldn't stomach him. So, yeah, that's, uh, ah, our good friend Wikipedia. I love Wikipedia. And I feel bad. I do. I use Wikipedia a lot. I feel bad that I don't have money to donate to them. Um, and for those of you who specifically want the article, it's uh, Wikipedia, Thomas Jefferson and religion. Oh, yeah, I've read over this one a few times. This is good stuff. Um, that is really, really good stuff in there. All right. Well, it is the top of the hour almost. So we're going to take a real quick moment to tell you what you are listening to. You're listening to K98 FM's K98 Talk. You are now tuned into the Bush Leagues of Talk Radio, right here on the all-new K98 Talk. That's right, the Bush Leagues of Talk Radio. This is uh, the morning mashup here on K98talk.com. Can't believe I got through the first hour. Yes! Oh, God, I have to do this again tomorrow. Two hours a day, five days a week. I, see, I don't know who's going to give up first. Me or you guys? Because after a while... You're going to be like, can we shut this one-handed MFR up, please? Um, oh, speaking of MFRs, uh, I watch most of the TV that I watch. I, I, I watch through Hulu Plus uh, or uh, through Netflix for stuff that is you know older. And by older, I mean already released on DVD. But Hulu Plus is fantastic. Uh, 16 of the best dollars a month that I spend is on... Um, Hulu Plus and Netflix. Those are two great services. But Hulu does have commercials, and one of them right now is for a Citibank um, card. And they they uh, it stars uh, Samuel Jackson, and they are so hilarious because every time he talks, there's just a part of me that wants to hear him go off, uh, wants to hear him say "mf'er." Um, because there's just, in one of the commercials, he looks up at the corner, and if you've ever watched or used Hulu on your computer, um, periodically when a commercial plays in the top right-hand corner, it says, is this ad relevant to you? And I've been watching it through our, our uh, Nintendo Wii. Since we have Hulu Plus, we can actually watch it on other devices. And so I watch TV on my TV. Go figure. I mean, who'd have thunk it in this day and age? But uh, in this one commercial, he looks up at the corner, is this ad relevant? Is money relevant? And I'm just thinking he needs to say, is money relevant, motherfucker? Of course it's ads relevant. <laughs> oh, I shot Marvin in the face. What the fuck do you do that for? Kind of thing. You know, I'm just like on the second episode of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., which is, no matter what, it's just so many people are t saying that show is terrible. I have really enjoyed it. But in the second episode, at the very end of the episode, there's a cameo by Sam Mr. Samuel Jackson as Nick Fury. And he's standing there, he's like, Six days! You've had this plane for six days! And it just is hilarious. So, yeah, every time those Citibank uh, commercials come on, I laugh because, you know, I love Samuel Jackson. Um, he is awesome. I mean, maybe he's a douchebag in real life. But he is hilariously funny. And um, so, yeah. Uh, how, how I got there, I really don't know. Oh, yeah, Randy Orton did win last. I actually talked about that at the beginning of last hour, Steve. Um, but uh, Randy Orton, new WWE World Heavyweight Champion. Uh, the unified title. Which, man, they did apparently a, a poll on 
WWE.com about picking the name of the new championship. And there were things like the undisputed WWE champion, undisputed world champion, unified champion, I think is the one that won, which is so terrible. But all the stories that when I was looking up this morning to find the results from last night, all the stories that um, were mentioned were just calling it the WWE World Heavyweight title, which is a combination of the two different names of those two titles. And that one, I think, works best. But, um, oh, go Steve, boycotting the WWE for a while. I like that. Sadly, we just don't have so many choices. I mean, yeah, TNA on Thursday nights with... Uh, impact and and uh but it, at least at least in that match from what i read there wasn't any interference at least orton actually won um yeah I, steve saying he's one of the, another reason why he's protesting is the the combining of the titles I, that's probably a good idea i don't actually watch any of their programs i, I just watch clips on youtube so you're not getting any money out of me. That's for sure. <laughs> ah, so, let's see here. F yeah, that uh, Fisher, that dude's crazy. I think, we're, okay, we're done talking about him. What else do we have going on here in the news? So, there was a bit of a hubbub. Um, last week, obviously, uh, Nelson Mandela passed away. Um, which was... A, a sad thing because Nelson Mandela was a um, inspirational leader and did a lot for the people of South Africa. And there's been a, a big dust up. I'll, I'll get into comics in a minute, Steve. Um, and there's been lots of talk about him and and the fact that he had communist leanings and and people jumped over. Um, Bill O'Reilly, because Bill O'Reilly had mentioned that he was a communist, but then subsequently mentioned that he was a great man. Interestingly, the the clips that were used left out the part where he's talking about him being a great man. And then at the funeral, our illustrious leader, who just to me comes off like one of the biggest, snootiest jackholes ever. Um, and I bought in, man, after, after his the speech he gave in 2004 at John, at the, uh, uh, the democratic, um, convention when John Kerry was put up as the party's, um, nominee back when I was still a Democrat. Uh, yeah, his speech was fantastic. And I kind of bought into the 2008 campaign. I was a little skeptical, but within a few months of him being in office, I realized that there's there's no hope, there's no change, it's just the same old crap every day. Anywho, um, he reminds me a lot of one of those just really hoity-toity snooty guys, the kind of elitists that listen to, you know, that have their nose up in the air and they kind of just stereotypical college professor, professor douchebags. And, uh, so at the funeral, there was a picture was taken of him with, um, I think the British prime minister and some other leader who's actually a fairly attractive female um, taking a, a selfie together and they're all smiling and and everything in the and in the picture Michelle's looking a different direction Michelle Obama and she looks pissed and the people around look pretty somber um, well according to the guy who took the picture he just happened to snap it he didn't think he was getting anything special and the mood in the area was what was a pretty festive mood. They were really celebrating Mandela's life. Uh, but it sure has given fodder to those who dislike our president and have just jumped all over him. Uh, 
I didn't watch the proceedings. I have to admit, I was doing other things. But even beyond that, I wasn't there. So I don't know the situation. I know it certainly looks bad. And it's just something else that this guy's reputation is already so heinously tarnished. Oh, it's Denmark's prime minister. Um, Helen Thomas Schmidt. Hey, Schmitty. Uh, no, Bill O'Reilly wasn't a communist. Bill O'Reilly mentioned that um, Mandela was a communist. Um, but, uh, yeah. Anyway. Um, oh. So, he, he takes this picture, and to give the guy the benefit of the doubt, it probably was very innocent. It probably was not inappropriate for the setting. And you really think about it, the scrutiny that the president is under. Shoot, the scrutiny that any famous person is under at this point. I mean, whether you are the president or whether your last name is Kardashian, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, some jackass has a camera shoved in your face. And sure, when you become famous, when you become a politician or a leader, you have to sacrifice uh, some of your, you know, your uh, privacy. And that's part of it. That is part of the game. But I don't think any of them really intended or wanted to have that much of their privacy sacrificed. Does anyone really deserve to have a camera in their face? all day long, every day. I mean, it's amazing that the president can drop a deuce without having some camera sitting there judging the way he's wiping his ass. I mean, can you imagine the the dust up if we found out that the presidential toilet paper went under instead of over? Because by God, it would become a national issue. How dare the president be so stupid to have the toilet paper go over when he knows it would save the taxpayers money if it went under or some other hoo-ha. And that would happen. You know it would happen. Karen freaking T it. Because that's how stupid people are nowadays. That's how much they look for anything to divide each other. Look for anything to hate. And, you know, the president is... He's a terrible president. He is, his leadership is non-existent. His managerial skills suck. Uh, all he's really, really good at, honestly, is blaming people and giving speeches. That seems to be the only two things this man can do well. He can give a really good speech, and he's really good at blaming folks for his stuff. Um, but, I mean, in this dude's defense, if he happens to be sitting there with a couple of other leaders and takes a picture of himself. Let's say you were at some event. Let's say, God forbid, a friend or family member or someone that you know passes away. But this is a person who wanted to have a very festive funeral. And some folks are there, and they haven't seen each other in years or months or something. And they decide to take a picture of each other together. Is that really so bad? If you are at an event, if let's say you're at a funeral, and even if it's not a festive funeral, let's say you're at a funeral, and you happen to, to run into someone you haven't seen in years or months, and you guys get talking, you take a moment and you want to take a picture together, is that really inappropriate? If you think about it like that, I mean, do you want to do that in the middle of service while the preacher, priest, whatever is administering over the whatever it is you're doing with your funeral because I never quite get funeral services there is there really any set type of funeral service I mean is I think with like Catholics they do a basic they do a normal church service and I think the same thing with Episcopalians um, I digress because I don't want to think about funerals That's those are no fun um, but is it really inappropriate to snap a picture with a couple people that you haven't seen in forever? Something to think about. 
Because honest to God, at this point in time, the President of the United States, especially this President, it doesn't matter what he says or what he does. There's a large portion of the population and some very vocal folks in the media that are going to tell you how bad it is, how stupid he was for doing it, how evil he is for trying to convince you of that. And uh, no matter what, I mean, seriously, he could, Obama could come out and say, <clears throat> excuse my bad impression real quick, say, the sky, that's blue. And the grass, at least where my dog pees, that's green. And uh, instantaneously, the Rush Limbaugh's, Sean Hannity's, and Ann Coulter's of the world will be screaming at the top of their lungs, oh my God, how can he say the sky is blue? The sky's really purple. What kind of moron is this? How could the American people have been so stupid to elect this guy that he doesn't even know what color the grass is? They did it to George Bush. Now, granted, W... <laughs> God, I love the man. He couldn't talk. I mean, not that I'm doing a very good job here, mind you. But... Uh, the man was about as eloquent as a dung beetle. And, um... And so he was just rife for the pickings. Um, and in fact, I remember one of my favorite interviews I ever heard with him. He was on on NPR one day. And had, they were talking about something, and he referred to the Democratic Party as the Democrat Party. And the interviewer stopped him and said, um... You know, that Democrats actually, that's a slur. That's considered a slur if you refer to the Democratic Party as the Democrat Party. And um, he just chuckled. He said, you know, I don't talk that good. Which was funny because I think in his case, he really wasn't meaning it as a an attack. He just doesn't talk good. But that kind of thing. He said Dem he would say Democrat Party, and the Lib Labs will have a heyday screaming, oh, look at how disrespectful he is, and blah, 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 blah. And, <laughs> and it's so funny, because he was a terrible president. Obama's a terrible president. There's so many things to criticize those two administrations for. And what, what do we spend our time criticizing about? Selfies? Um golf games um, say removing an ick off the end of a word yeah how about the fact that both of them have abused the constitution have uh, done things that have taken away our, our liberties how about the rampant just um misuse of of not only public money but public trust and the fact that these guys can't successfully run anything I think that is there's so much to go after them for that uh why why do we bother with what we do um why would anyone so yeah, my uh, my good friend Steve here says, why would anybody want the toilet paper to go over instead of under? He should be impeached for that kind of crap. You know, I actually tend to use the toilet paper going over instead of under. Um, I mean, it doesn't bother me one way or the other. But when I'm putting on the toilet paper roll, I typically have it go over. Uh, so, here's a great question. And I want this emailed to me, folks. How do you do your toilet paper? Are you over or under? Over or under? That's what we need to know. And uh, at some point, I'm going to get a uh, Facebook page set up. I'm actually in the process of doing that. I uh, haven't really gotten very far with it. So there will be a Facebook page set up for the morning mashup. Um, and in fact, it's, it's there. There's just nothing on it. So you can head over to facebook.com forward slash the morning mashup K98 talk and click on that like button. And uh, let's see. 
just for... Yeah, so there are only two people that like this so far, and I'm one of them. But uh, feel free to, to go in and, and like that. That would be great. And uh, anyway, yeah, I kind of forgotten I'd made that, but it's it's bare bones. There's nothing on there right now. But yeah, I would like to know, toilet paper, over or under? This is important stuff, folks. The time allotted for you on the toilet can be limited. And there are times that just right when you need it the least, you need to drop a deuce. So, over or under? That's how we want to know. Okay. Uh, let's see here. We're going to go into... There was something about bank reform that I wanted to talk about at some point, but I'll get into that later. Oh, um... And at some point this week, I'm going to talk about the, uh, the Pope and how... Uh, Rush thinks the Pope is preaching Marxism, uh, but I'm not kind of in the mood for that today. <clears throat> so, what should we talk about? So we talked about that crazy man Fisher. Oh, okay. Here's a story. This guy's nuts. This is from uh, the Mirror, which is from the UK. And uh, I'm just going to read this story. I'm not going to play the video. Um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Well, maybe I'll read the story if I can get the thing to load. And I'm even on my good computer, and it's taken forever to load up. Okay, here's the headline. Man sells left testicle for $35,000 to buy his dream sports car. Okay, again... Man sells left testicle for $35,000 to buy his dream sports car. Uh, Mark Parasi wants a Nissan 370 and won't stop at anything to get it, including chopping off one of his most intimate body parts. Is he nuts? He's going to be less one nut by, by the time this is all said and done. <clears throat> Uh, this man is selling his left testicle for $35,000 to scientific research so he can afford his dream sports car. I hope he's paying cash for that car, seriously, because if he if he chops off his nut and then ends up financing this car and gets it repoed, man. <clears throat> Excuse me. Mark, uh... Parasi revealed the shocking decision on U.S. TV show The Doctors and said it was so he could finally own a Nissan 370. And while most men would cringe at the very thought, Mr. Parasi seemed completely at ease with his decision. Uh, women in the audience looked disgusted when he admitted his plans, with most of them holding their hands up to their mouths in shock. What a joke. Anyway, um, one of the show's hosts asked if he uh, argued for a higher fee, but Mr. Parasi confirmed it was a straight-out offer, which he accepted. Another host joked at the end, it's a Nissan for your left one. <laughs> yeah. So, what's your what are your balls worth? What would you, what is your price for your nuts? What would you? What do you want so bad that you would be willing to let go of a family jewel to own? Seriously, what? Because that is freaking.
crazy. <laughs> I mean, really freaking crazy. Oh, crap. Sorry, guys. I apparently had a... spyware program running in okay anyway um yeah what would what would you do if this happened to you manos oh and here's an interesting story 25 celebrities we didn't know were african american why even more importantly, why am I reading this? So, uh, oh my god. These websites that have ads that pop up and start playing videos immediately, they suck. Okay, so who's on this list? Mariah Carey? Uh, let's see the page. Uh, Cash Warren. Who the fuck is Cash Warren? I don't know who this is. Uh, next up on the list. I'll tell you, this is the quality radio you get from my show. Troyana Belisaro? Oh, she's from Pretty Little Liars. Um, interesting. Never watched that show. And Daniel Sunjata? Oh, what did I... Oh. Yeah, he's half black, half white. Looks kind of a uh, Hispanic. Good looking dude. Um, slash. Interesting. Did not know that. Uh, let's see who's next. This is from StyleBlazer.com. Maya Rudolph. Uh, she was in the Bridesmaids. Huh. And next, Nicole Richie. That girl's scary looking. Okay, first of all, we know she's black because she's Lionel Richie's uh, daughter. But that chick is just really scary. I mean, incredibly, incredibly scary. Gabrielle Reese? No, oh, volleyball star. She's uh, some Trinidad blood in her. Yeah, folks, I'm kind of reaching here, so... Got about a half hour left. Who knows what we're going to talk about. Um, Soledad O'Brien. Oh, I guess she's a... Oh, yeah, she's a uh, CNN host. I don't have cable, so I don't watch uh, CNN. Wentworth Miller. Yeah, he definitely looks Caucasian. Um, and he looks familiar, I just don't know what I saw him in. Meghan Markle? Uh, what has she been in? Yes, the show Suits. Never saw that. Rashida Jones? Oh, hey, she's Quincy Jones' daughter. Cool. Quincy Jones was, uh, you know, big, big music producer. He did a lot of, uh, Michael Jackson's early stuff, stuff with the Jackson 5. Um, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Uh, he is uh, part black and part Samoan. And he is, you know, the more I watch old stuff with him wrestling, he was truly one of my favorite wrestlers. I mean, you just can't help but smile watching the guy. Vin Diesel. Vin Diesel? Huh. His mother is Scottish, English, and German, but he never met his biological father. His stepfather is African-American. What? Oh, 
That's reaching, Ben. He's getting kind of wrinkly. Uh, Rosie O'Dawson. Yeah, I kind of knew that. Jordan Sparks. Kind of figured that one. Pete Wentz. Huh. From Fallout Boy. Oh, his grandfather's Jamaican. Yeah, I'm on. Never listened to Fallout Boy. They're like uh, one of the premier top 40 emo bands. Jessica S-Z-O-H-R. What the? I can't even begin to fathom how that's pronounced. Okay, so she was in Gossip Girl. Um, interesting. Okay. Uh, Darren Martin or Daryl Darnell Martin. No idea who that is. God, I'm sure this is horribly boring. How many more are there? Okay. We're down to the last five. Adriana Lima. She's like a model. It's a really unflattering picture of her too. Yikes. Derek Jeter. Ooh, he's not aging well. Yikes. Baseball player, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Chris Humphreys. That guy who married Kim Kardashian for about five seconds. God, he, that, that dude is not attractive. He's like Sasquatch, though, man. I swear to God, I think... And Kim Kardashian apparently is pretty short, but she looked like she came up to about his waist. I mean, he is like... A seven foot tall. Can you imagine how enormous his penis must be? I mean, really? If you were that tall, the schlong on that man must be unreal. Anyway, uh, up next is Melissa Gorga. Again, don't know who that is. Don't care enough to scroll down to find out. Carol Channing. Boy, she's old. Uh, oh, Broadway actress. Um... And the final celebrity on this list, Jennifer Beals, B-E-A-L-S. Oh, from Flashdance. Huh. Interesting. You know, I grew up in the 80s. I don't ever remember seeing that movie. Um, but anyway... Um, no, actually, Steve, I talked a story about the 25 actors people didn't, celebrities people didn't realize were black, and about how Chris Humphreys must have a huge, ginormous schlong because he's so freaking tall. Uh, that's all you missed. Um, but hey, this is a good time. I'm going to, we're going to talk a little bit about music. So it's the end of the year. People are coming up with their top music lists of the year. And, uh, I have done a few uh, myself, and today we're actually going to go over my top 15 EPs of 2013. Now, I was uh, lucky enough, I've got a, got a lot of great stuff sent to me over the year, and this was another year of great music. Now, from a lot of the music lists that I've seen out there, uh, a lot of it is pretty bad. In fact, if anyone listened to my pseudo pre-show that I did about a week ago where I did this for an hour. I went over uh, Rolling Stone's top 50 albums of the year list and it was pretty heinous, really. <laughs> it was just, yeah, pretty heinous. But so my top 15 EPs, I uh, and I did this last year as well, when coming up with my list of what I thought were my favorite and best albums of the year, uh, I realized that there were too many not only full-length albums, but EPs that in order to do it justice, I really needed to separate them and do an albums list, which I have a top 30 albums of 2013, and then the EPs, which is the top 15 EPs of 2013. And uh, so without any further ado, you can see this list over at my uh, my website, oklahomalefty.com, my music blog. All right, number 15 on the list is uh, 
one that my good friend Steve will know quite well since it's his band, a band called Otisburg. It's a project that is put together by himself and his friend Scott Ship. These guys met in Seattle, and that's when they started Otisburg, when they were both living out in Seattle. Since then, Steve's moved back to Oklahoma, but they've continued the project, and uh, Steve's actually working on putting up a lineup here in the Oklahoma City metro area, so hopefully we'll get them playing some shows. Uh, excuse me, I had to wet my whistle. Um, Otisburg plays uh, a type of uh, pop punk that also has hints of power pop in it. Uh, really good stuff. This EP, Uber Geek, is their second proper EP. Uh, they, it's their third release. Uh, their first, their debut release was an EP called Born Yesterday. Uh, came out in, I want to say, originally came out in 2007, and then they re-released it digitally a year or so ago. And then they put out a demo single called Sweet Love, and then Uber Geek. And of the three, Uber Geek is definitely the best. Um, with this, the one of the things you got to realize is with these two guys being in two separate states, and both being, you know, your average working class punk rock guys don't have a lot of money and um, are basically making these records for free. They are they are doing it in their rooms, in their homes, making it with zero money. Um, so you got to keep that um, keep that in mind. But with this record. Uh, the production definitely got better. These guys are learning how to make records in their homes, and it's definitely sounding better. Um, it's a five-song EP. Uh, one of the songs was originally on the uh, Born Yesterday EP, Hey Jennifer, which is one of my favorite songs of theirs. Great song. Um, and then this EP also includes the title track, which is an ode to geekdom, Uh the song Mistakes, which is probably the best song these guys have ever written. Catchy as hell song. Uh, and there's also a really, really good um, instrumental track on there called uh, Stop This Car and Pull Over, I Think I'm Going to Be Sick. It's a it's a demo, bro, but really, really good song. So that's uh, good stuff there. You can find that over on Bandcamp. And uh, if you head over to my website, uh, OklahomaLefty.com, go to the top EPs of 2013, you'll find a link to the Bandcamp page and uh, all that good stuff there. And uh, actually, Steve did tell me you've got a complete lineup, but uh, you guys haven't played together yet, so uh, hopefully that'll we'll get some shows soon, so that'll be awesome. All right, number 14 on the list is Adelaide uh, by Mike... I can never pronounce this guy's name. Uh, Felumly? He was the... He played uh, drums in the Smoking Popes and Alkaline Trio... Uh, it's a really, really good power pop release. Uh, and, uh, yeah, it's just really good power pop is about the best way. In a lot of ways, his stuff reminds me of Mike Park in that it's the it's the punk rock solo artist, but he does, instead of going the whole kind of folky country route, he's gone the poppy route. Uh, so it's not like straight power pop like say a Kurt Baker um, who is actually also on this list it it's really it reminds me more of Mike Park than anything else um, but it's it, it's really really good stuff really 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 good all right next on the list is a band or the artist Val Ventura with her EP Sundown California uh, pop punk freaking fantastic um, sounds like something that would have been uh, released on Doctor Strange Records or Lookout way back in the day and uh, was recorded at the Sonic Iguana Studios with Mash G. G. I. O. Gorgini, or I can't pronounce his name, really well known producer in the uh, punk rock world. Um, so that is, that's, that's awesome stuff there. All right, number 12 is The Great Escape by Turf War. And uh, Turf War is a band that kind of mixes Americana and Power Pop. It's in my review, I explained it. It's like um, 
It's a record, and I'll just quote it, record-born equal parts of Twist and Shout era Beatles, World Class Fad era Paul Westerberg, Sally Ebb and Shot era Two Cow Garage, Chasing Heather Crazy era Guided by Voices, and a little bit of Bash and Pop. Uh, so it's uh, it's it's really fun. If you like any of those bands, it's definitely worth checking out. Uh, number 11 are two singles by the band The Feels. This is a, a pretty new group. It's put together by uh, Christian Stephos Milger... God dang it, man. Some of these people's names. Man, bless your hearts with names that, like that. I'm, granted, I've got the most boring name in the world, Dave Brown. I mean, good lord. But some of these names are kind of hard to pronounce. Uh, this, this dude, or lady, I'm not sure which, was in Candy Hearts and The Unlovables... And this is the latest project, The Feels. They released uh, two songs on Bandcamp. Uh, the first one was called uh, Purple Heart. And then the other one was I-95 In Another Life. That song is phenomenal. I mean, that song just should be huge. It's uh, just a wickedly good, catchy song. Um Next up, we're into the top 10, uh, Losing Days EP by Frank Turner. Uh, this was a kind of a complimentary EP to Turner's new album, or latest album, Tape Deck Heart. It includes a cover of uh, Biffy Clyro's Who's Got a Match, also has the uh, Losing Days song from Tape Deck Heart, uh, and a really good song called Hits and Misses. Uh, it's, it's Frank Turner. I mean, come on. The dude's awesome. Uh, number nine, uh, Kurt Baker with his Girls Got Money, Yeah, Yeah single. Uh, Kurt Baker is, honest to God, the best artist right now in Power Pop. Just hands down, if you like early Cheap Trick, early Elvis Costello, you will love this guy. In fact, he sounds like um, My Aim is True era Elvis Costello singing with uh, Heaven Tonight era Cheap Trick. It's just that freaking good. Uh, number eight, uh, Shocking, which is a split EB EP between the Bouncing Souls and the Menzingers. On this, they each covered one of each other's songs and then did a new song. Uh, the Bouncing Souls, let's see. Man, the Bouncing Souls covered... Um, God, I can't even remember. Which songs they covered? They were well. Menzingers took on the Bouncing Souls classic "Kate Is Great," which was from their self-titled album, which is a great song. Um, the Bouncing Souls did the Menzingers' "Burn After Writing," which appeared on last year's "On the Impossible Past" uh, Menzingers record. And uh, the Menzingers are actually coming to Oklahoma in it's either it's sometime early next year and they're going to be playing with off with their heads at the conservatory. It is going to be awesome. And I can't wait for that. All right. Number seven, the band habits with train wrecks. This is another EP. This one is so just incredibly good. This is a band that you can, when you listen to them, you hear, you're just straight up rock and roll. You hear alt country, you hear post hardcore, you hear all these different elements mixed in. And it, what it really is, is just great rock and roll music. Um, uh, can't speak highly enough of this EP. Very, very good. And, uh, you can also get it on not only through their Bandcamp page, but through, uh, death for false hope records for free. I highly suggest downloading it. Uh, next up, uh, number six, uh, this wall is dedicated to Liam and his mates by Nobody Ever. This is they play a um, uh, powerfully emotional melodic mid-tempo punk rock that mixes elements of pop punk, post-hardcore, emo, melodic hardcore, indie rock, and classic rock. It's from my review. Um, this is uh, basically if you like everything from fans of everything from Iron Sheik to the Gaslight Anthem to Red City Radio to the Bouncing Souls to Super Chunk should really find something in this in this album or in the CP to, to enjoy. Uh, honestly, all these records you should just go out and get cause they're all freaking great. Um, next up, number five, uh, crimes with their self-titled EP. 
this one grabbed from the first minute I heard this this EP. I was like, holy God, this band is something special. And uh, it's again, it's that in that vein of of punk that mixes a whole lot of different things that you can hear, you know, hints of hot water music. You can hear hints of social distortion. You can hear hints of a veil. You can hear Sam. I am, you can hear all sorts of different stuff in it. And it's just really, really good. There's, there's been this crop of bands in the last few years that have taken a lot of the different types of, of things that have come out of the punk rock scene and just kind of mixed it all together. And, and they've, they've produced some really fantastic results. Um, and uh, Crimes is, is one of those. So, uh, And Nobody Ever also, the previous band, is another one. that. And same with Habits. These are all these bands do this stuff and do it extremely well. Hell, even uh, Oklahoma's own Red City Radio does that to some extent. Um, all right, number four. Uh, speaking of Oklahoma's own, they stay dead with their uh, single Bruise Banner. First new song from them in a while. Uh, they Stay Dead about nine months ago, lost their bass player, Dave Klein. He had left the band to uh, play bass in Black Flag and spent three quarters of the last year touring the world with Black Flag and living in Texas and uh, has now come home, uh, has moved back to Edmond, has rejoined They Stay Dead, and they not only knocked out a new song, uh, which they recorded in Edmond with Mike Connect. To D, I think that's how you pronounce his name, uh, from the All American Rejects, and or, or it's, I like to think of him from the band Mr. Crispy. I recorded in his house, uh, where they've recorded all their stuff. He's a phenomenal producer. He also produced the new direct hit album uh, Brainless God, which is really good. I haven't gotten a chance to review it. Uh, in fact, there are a few different records this year. I just haven't gotten around to reviewing, sadly. Um, but hopefully will at some point. All right, number three on the list uh, is the uh, Wedding 7-inch split EB, EP between Mast Intruder and Dan Vapid and the Cheats. So this is a really, really cool release. Um, so the, uh, the guy, Randy, who uh, runs Solidarity Records, uh, was getting married. And so as a wedding present... And what ended up being sent out to people invited to the album, to the, to the wedding, uh, Mast Intruder and Dan Vapid and the Cheats each wrote a song for the wedding. Um, the uh, Valerie's Getting Married is the name of the song that Mast Intruder wrote. Randy's Getting Married is a song Dan Vapid and the Cheats wrote. These are two of the best bands in pop punk today. Both songs are amazing. If you like pop punk at all, you probably already know these bands. If you don't know these bands, I really question whether or not you truly like pop punk because these are two of the best bands around today in the genre. And you need to just go buy this. Go get it. It's great. Do it now. Don't stop and collect $200. Just go do it. Um, okay, we're Tim toward the end. Number two is The Warning Shots with their EP 6 to Midnight. Uh, this is a almost, for lack of a better term, super group, guys from the Boston area. It's led by Mark Lind of the Ducky Boys. He's singing, and uh, it's pretty much exactly what you would expect from Mark Lind. Uh, high energy, catchy, punk rock and roll music that is reminiscent of of you know 77 style punk with uh, elements of pop punk and uh, rock and roll in it it's you take um, you take the upbeat Bruce Springsteen stuff you take stiff little fingers and um, and say the copyrights you put those three bands in a blender and you get the warning shots it's yeah and the best EP of the year, in my humble opinion, is... Okay, that's my pathetic drum roll. Texas and Tennessee by Lucero. This is 
not only my favorite EP of the year, it is probably my favorite Lucero release. I'm relatively new to Lucero. I started listening to them a couple years ago, and I have subsequently gotten all of their records. Last year, there was a big kind of hubbub and to-do over their women and, and uh, work album. Because with the previous album, uh, 1372... Crap, I can't remember the name of it. Anyway, they added a horn section. And uh, for those of you who've never heard Blue Zero, they're an alt-country band from Tennessee, from Memphis specifically. And uh, they're just outstandingly good. One of the actual standard bearers of the genre. Um, but they added a horn section, which brought in a whole new element of Southern soul. Which is fan- which is great. It just mixes beautifully with it. But their Women in Work album, while really really good, kind of was missing any of the kind of spark of of their punk rock heritage. Um, and it was it just something was a little different. Well, this EP, Texas and Tennessee, combines the elements of what a lot of people consider newer Lucero, which was the last two albums, and old Lucero. And it's just perfect. I can listen to this EP over and over and over, and I have. And this has almost never left my MP3 player this year since getting it. And my MP3 player, unfortunately, only has, I think, 8 gigs on it, 4 or 8 gigs. So it's limited space. Uh, but this is almost always on there. And uh, the title track is amazing. There's a song called Breathless Love on there that's amazing. It is just, uh, as I put it, the lyrics are lovelorn and whiskey-soaked. Ooh, that was one of my more uh, colorful descriptions there. <laughs> anyway, um so yeah, that is it. That's my top 15 uh, EPs of the year. Uh, tomorrow we'll we'll jump into my top 30 list. And what I'll probably do, uh, just to drag it out, I'll because my top 30 I did in three separate posts, uh, 10 each day. So we'll do 10 every day. Um, and that'll be fun. And, ooh, hey, this looks kind of interesting. Five ways the earth itself is going insane. Gotta love the folks at crack.com. And let me see if there are any other real quick stories. Steve, you have any suggestions of anything I need to talk about here toward the end? We've got about 10 minutes left. Um, oh, let's see. Man, some of the stuff I just uh, don't want to quite get into because it's going to be Kind of a long, drawn-out thing to discuss. Um, Let me see here. I've got stories. Why parents of daughters are more likely to vote Republican. Oh, we'll get into that one later. Um, Change natural... Oh, here's a good one. Um, Okay, so this is from Yahoo Shine. Um, headline, change natural ha- hairstyle or get expelled. School tells 12-year-old girl, and she's got a big bouffant hair. I mean, it is. She's got big old fro hair. Um, oh, update. School officials said Tuesday they would require Van Dyke to style her hair differently, but not necessarily to cut or straighten it. Okay, so here's the story. A 12-year-old girl will be expelled from a Florida school unless she gets her hair under control, school officials have told her. Uh, Vanessa Van Dyke, an honors student and violinist at the Faith Christian Academy in Orlando, tells WKMG that administrators have given her one week to decide whether to cut and shape her hair or leave the school, which she has attended since third grade. Oh, this makes it even more interesting. I figured this was stupidity of public schools. Ah, it's nice to see we have insanity from parochial schools as well. Yay! Um, Faith Christian Academy did not meet, immediately respond to a request for comment from Yahoo Shine, and Van Dyke's mother, Sabrina Kent, could not be reached for comment. 
but WKMG reports that the school's handbook includes a section on hair that says it, quote, must be a natural color and must be a and must not be a distraction end quote uh, stating examples that include mohawks shaved designs and rat tails oh god i never understood rat tails my god who 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 thought that was a good idea who anyone seriously a rat tail good idea on anyone ever ever you know Bad idea. Bad, 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 bad. Oh, no, I'll, I did not, Steve. We might have to leave that for tomorrow. Um, let's see here. Um, however, notes Kent, quote, a distraction to one person is not a distraction to another. You can have a kid come in with pimples on his face. Are, are you going to call that a distraction? Ooh, that's a good point. I never thought about that. Uh, Van Dyke wears her hair in a natural African-American style, which she says she won't change. It says that I'm unique, she tells WKMG. First of all, it's puffy, and I like it that way. I know people will tease me about it uh, because it's not straight. I don't fit in. She notes that fellow students have recently been teasing her about her hairstyle, and it has only become an issue with the school since her family logged complaints about the inc- about those incidents. Interesting. Still, if the Faith Christian Academy administrators won't reverse course, Van Dyke says she will go to school elsewhere. Quote, I'm depressed about leaving my friends and people that I've known for a while, but I'd rather... Uh, ha- I'd rather have that than the uh, principals and administrators picking on me and saying that I should change my hair, she explains. In September, a seven-year-old Oklahoma girl was forced to switch schools after administrators at uh, Deborah Brown Community School, a charter school, wouldn't let her keep her dreadlocked hair. Uh, Other incidents earlier this year have included... Dang, a seven-year-old with dreadlocks? Damn. Uh, Other incidents this year have included a five-year-old from Ohio getting suspended from kindergarten when he showed up with a short mohawk and a 15-year-old honor student getting kicked out of her Utah middle school for dyeing her locks auburn. Auburn? Really? There are people with naturally colored hair that's auburn. God almighty. In June, another Ohio school was the target of backlash after it sent out a letter uh, detailing this fall's dress code, including a ban on, quote, Afro puffs and small twisted braids, end quote. Afro puffs. I don't know what that is. Small twisted braid. What harm is that? I mean, seriously. Small twisted braids. I mean, I can almost, almost see someone with a huge-ass purple mohawk being a distraction. Because, for one thing, it's going to be standing on end. It could be blocking people's view. Wow. Um, The dean of students quickly apologized and said the rule was not directed at girls' hair, but aimed at male students who were expected to be, quote, well-groomed, end quote. Uh, as for Van Dyke, her mom is standing behind her. Quote, I'm going to fight for my daughter, Kent says. If she wants her hair like that, she will keep her hair like that. There are people out there who may think that natural hair is not appropriate. She is beautiful the way she is. And if you see a picture of this girl, her hair is not outrageous at all. I mean, seriously, there are sitcoms from the 1980s that have girls with bigger hair than this. Uh, both white and black. Um, shoot, Tracy Turnblad's hair was bigger than this. Uh, so, yep, it's nice to see that stupidity in schools goes everywhere. But yes. Oh, and uh, so, real quick note as we end up the show here: uh, comics. I have not talked to comics today, but. Um, we did, uh, I have been reading some, uh, at the moment I am reading, I'm finishing up, um, all-star Western volume two, uh, and pretty much everything right now I'm reading is new 52 related. 
and I'm actually just about done with that, and I need to finish that up because Volume 3 just came out and is on hold for me at the library. Yes, I can't wait. Uh, also reading Justice League Volume 3, uh, Throne of Atlantis. So far, that's really good. Uh, reading Wonder Woman Volume 2, uh, I believe it's called Guts. So far, that's really good. I'm really looking forward to number 3, the vol third volume of that, because they start tying in... Uh, the new gods uh, with uh, with Wonder Woman, which I think is really cool and something that should have been done a long time ago, because so much of Wonder Woman's mythology is based on well, mythology um, and her dealings with the new god or with uh, the Greek gods, and having her deal with the new gods that Jack Kirby created and Dark Side and all that, I think is just great. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I'm also reading, I'm finishing up Justice League Dark Volume 2, and there's something else on the stack right now. And I'm drawing a blank. I've actually got a stack of quite a few things. Um, like uh, Swamp Thing Volume 1, um, and that's again New 52. Uh, one of the Superman, and a few other things, but... Uh, yeah, we'll talk more about comics next time. I also rewatched, and this is actually something I'm, I'm going to try to remember to talk about tomorrow. I rewatched Green Lantern, the the Ryan Reynolds film this weekend, and you know what? Every time I watch that movie, it gets better. Yes, there are issues. Yes, there are flaws. Uh, but it's not the steaming pile of crap that so many in the comic book world like to say it is. But uh. Hey guys, we are out of time. Thank you, thank you, thank you for listening to the Morning Mashup here on K98talk.com. I appreciate you guys tuning in, and uh, we'll be here tomorrow morning at 8-ish. I hope everyone has a great day. Take care, y'all. The evolution of talk radio has begun. You are listening to K98talk.com. You are now tuned into the Bush Leagues of Talk Radio right here on the all-new K98Talk.